LibriVox.org. Recording by Calm Dragon. Good Wives by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 7 Consequences. Mrs. Chester's fair was so very elegant and select that it was considered a great honor by the young ladies of the neighborhood to be invited to take a table, and every one was much interested in the matter. Amy was asked, but Joe was not, which was fortune for all parties, as her elbows were decidedly akimbo at this period of her life, and it took a good many hard knocks to teach her how to get on easily. The haughty, uninteresting creature was let severely alone. But Amy's talent and taste were duly complimented by the offer of the art table, and she exerted herself to prepare and secure appropriate and valuable contributions to it. Everything went on smoothly till the day before the fair opened. Then there occurred one of the little skirmishes, which it is almost impossible to avoid when some five-and-twenty women, old and young, with all their private piques and prejudices, try to work together. Maychester was rather jealous of Amy, because the latter was a great favorite than herself, and just at this time several trifling circumstances occurred to increase the feeling. Amy's dainty pen-and-ink work entirely eclipsed May's painted vases. That was one thorn. Then the all-conquering tutor had danced four times with Amy at a late party, and only once with May. That was thorn number two. But the chief grievance that rankled in her soul, and gave an excuse for her unfriendly conduct, was a rumor which some obliging gossip had whispered to her, that the March girls had made fun of her at the Lambs. All of the blame of this should have fallen upon Joe for her naughty imitation had been too lifelike to escape detection, and the frolicsome lambs had permitted the joke to escape. No hint of this had reached the culprits, however, and Amy's dismay can be imagined when, the very evening before the fair, as she was putting the last touches to her pretty table, Mrs. Chester, who, of course, resented the supposed ridicule of her daughter, said, in a bland tone, but with a cold look. I find, dear, that there is some feeling among the young ladies about my giving this table to anyone but my girls. As this is the most prominent, and some say the most attractive table of all, and they are the chief getters up of the fair, it is thought best for them to take this place. I'm sorry, but I know you are too sincerely interested in the cause to mind a little personal disappointment, and you shall have another table if you like. Mrs. Chester fancied beforehand that it would be easy to deliver this little speech, but when the time came she found it rather difficult to utter it naturally, with Amy's unsuspicious eyes looking straight at her full of surprise and trouble. Amy felt that there was something behind this, but would not guess what, and said quietly, feeling hurt, and showing that she did. Perhaps you'd rather I took no table at all. Now, my dear, don't have any ill feeling, I beg. It's merely a matter of expediency, you see. My girls will naturally take the lead, and this table is considered their proper place. I think it very appropriate to you and feel very grateful for your efforts to make it so pretty. But we must give up our private wishes, of course. And I will see that you have a good place elsewhere. Wouldn't you like the flower table? The little girls undertook it, but they are discouraged. You could make a charming thing of it, and the flower table is always attractive, you know. Especially to gentlemen, added May with a look which enlightened Amy as to one cause of her sudden fall from favor. She colored angrily, but took no other notice of that girlish sarcasm, and answered with unexpected amiability. It shall be as you please, Mrs. Chester. I'll give up my place here at once, and attend to the flowers if you like. You can put your own things on your own table if you prefer, began May, feeling a little conscious-stricken, as she looked at the pretty racks, the painted shells, 
and quaint illuminations Amy had so carefully made and so gracefully arranged. She meant it kindly, but Amy mistook her meaning and said quickly, Oh, certainly, if they are in your way, and sweeping her contributions into her apron pell-mell, she walked off, feeling that herself and her works of art had been insulted past forgiveness. Now she's mad. Oh, dear, I wish I hadn't asked you to speak, Mama, said May, looking disconsolately at the empty spaces on her table. Girls' quarrels are soon over, returned her mother, feeling a trifle ashamed of her own part in this one, as well she might. The little girls hailed Amy and her treasures with delight. With cordial reception somewhat soothed her perturbed spirit, and she fell to work determined to succeed florally, if she could not artistically. But everything seemed against her. It was late, and she was tired. Everyone was too busy with their own affairs to help her, and the little girls were only hindrances, for the dears fussed and chattered like so many magpies, making a great deal of confusion in their artless efforts to preserve the most perfect order. The evergreen arch wouldn't stay firm after she got it up, but wiggled and threatened to tumble down on her head when the hanging baskets were filled. Her best tile got a splash of water, which left a cephia tear on the cupid's cheek. She bruised her hands with hammering, and got cold working in a draft, which last affliction filled her with apprehensions for the morrow. Any girl reader who has suffered like afflictions will sympathize with poor Amy and wish her well through her task. There was great indignation at home when she told her story that evening. Her mother said it was a shame, but told her she had done right. Beth declared she wouldn't go to the fair at all, and Joe demanded why she didn't take all her pretty things and leave those mean people to get on without her. Because they are mean is no reason why I should be. I hate such things, and though I think I have a right to be hurt, I don't intend to show it. They will feel that more than angry speeches or huffy actions, won't they, Marmy? That's the right spirit, my dear. A kiss for a blow is always best, though it's not very easy to give it sometimes, said her mother, with an air of one who had learned the difference between preaching and practicing. In spite of various very natural temptations to resent and retaliate, Amy adhered to her resolution all the next day bent on conquering her enemy by kindness. She began well, thanks to a silent reminder that came to her unexpectedly, but most opportunely. As she arranged her table that morning, while the little girls were in their anteroom filling the baskets, she took up her pet production, a little book, the antique cover of which her father had found among his treasures and in which on leaves of vellum she had beautifully illuminated different texts. As she turned the pages rich and dainty devices with very pardonable pride, her eye fell upon one verse that made her stop and think. Framed in brilliant scroll work of scarlet, blue, and gold, with little spirits of good will helping one another, up and down among the thorns and flowers were the words, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I ought, but I don't, thought Amy, as her eye went from the bright page to May's discontented face behind the big vases that could not hide the vacancies her pretty work had once filled. Amy stood a minute, turning the leaves in her hand, reading on each some sweet rebuke for all heart-burnings and uncharitableness of spirit. Many wise and true sermons are preached us every day by unconscious ministers in street, school, office, or home. Even a fair table may become a pulpit, if it can offer the good and helpful words which are never out of season. Amy's conscience preached her little sermon from that text, then and there, and she did what many of us do not always do, took the sermon to her heart and straightway put it in practice. A group of girls were standing about May's table, admiring the pretty things, and talking over the change of saleswomen. They dropped their voices, but Amy knew they were speaking of her, hearing one side of the story and judging accordingly. 
It was not pleasant, but a better spirit had come over her, and presently a chance offered for proving it. She heard May say sorrowfully, It's too bad, for there's no time to make other things, and I don't want to fill up with odds and ends. The table was just complete then, now it's spoiled. I dare say she'd put them back if you asked her, suggested someone. How could I after all the fuss, began May, but she did not finish, for Amy's voice came across the hall, saying pleasantly, You may have them, and welcome, without asking, if you want them. I was just thinking I'd offer to put them back, for they belong to your table rather than mine. Here they are. Please take them, and forgive me if I was hasty in carrying them away last night. As she spoke, Amy returned her contribution with a nod and a smile, and hurried away again feeling that it was easier to do a friendly thing than it was to stay and be thanked for it. Now I call that lovely of her, don't you? cried one girl. May's answer was inaudible, but another young lady whose temper was evidently a little soured by making lemonade, added, with a disagreeable laugh, Very lovely, for she knew she wouldn't sell them at her own table. Now that was hard. When we make little sacrifices, we like to have them appreciated. At least, for a minute, Amy was sorry she had done it, feeling that virtue was not always its one reward. But it is, and she presently discovered, for her spirits began to rise, and her table to blossom under her skillful hands, the girls were very kind, and that one little lack seemed to have cleared the atmosphere amazingly. It was a very long day, and a hard one for Amy, and she sat behind her table often quite alone, for the little girls deserted very soon. Few cared to buy flowers in summer and her bouquets began to droop long before night. The art table was the most attractive in the room. There was a crowd about it all day long, and the tenders were constantly flying to and fro with important faces and rattling money boxes. Amy often looked wistfully across, longing to be there, where she felt at home and happy, instead of in a corner with nothing to do. It might seem no hardship to some of us, but to a pretty, blithe young girl it was not only tedious, but very trying, and the thought of Laurie and his friends made it a real martyrdom. She did not go home till night, and then she looked so pale and quiet that they knew the day had been a hard one, though she made no complaint, and did not even tell what she had done. Her mother gave her an extra cordial cup of tea. Beth helped her dress and made a charming little wreath for her hair, while Jo astonished her family by getting herself up with unusual care, and hinting darkly that the tables were about to be turned. Don't do anything rude, pray Jo. I won't have any fuss made, so let it all pass and behave yourself, begged Amy as she departed early, hoping to find a reinforcement of flowers to refresh her poor little table. I merely intend to make myself entrancingly agreeable to everyone I know, and to keep them in your corner as long as possible. Teddy and his boys will lend a hand, and we'll have a good time yet, returned Joe, leaning over the gate to watch for Lori. Presently the familiar tramp was heard in the dusk, and she ran out to meet him. Is that my boy? As sure as this is my girl and Lori tucked her hand under his arm with the air of a man whose every wish was gratified. Oh, Teddy, such doings, and Joe told Amy's wrongs with sisterly zeal. A flock of our fellows are going to drive over by and by, and I'll be hanged if I don't make them buy every flower she's got. And camp down before her table afterward, said Lori, espousing her cause with warmth. The flowers are not at all nice, Amy says and the fresh ones may not arrive in time. I don't wish to be unjust or suspicious, but I shouldn't wonder if they never came at all. When people do one mean thing, they are very likely to do another, observed Joe in a disgusted voice. Didn't Hayes give you the best of our gardens? I told him to. I didn't know that. He forgot, I suppose, and as your grandpa was poorly... I didn't like to worry him by asking, though I did want some. 
Now, Joe, how could you think there was any need of asking? They are just as much yours as mine. Don't we always go halves and everything? began Lorry, in the tone that always made Joe turn thorny. Gracious, I hope not. Half of some of your things wouldn't suit me at all. But we mustn't stand philandering here. I've got to help Amy, so you go and make yourself splendid. And if you'll be so very kind as to let Hayes take a few nice flowers up to the hall, I'll bless you forever. Couldn't you do it now? asked Lorry, so suggestively that Joe shut the gate in his face with inhospitable haste, and called through the bars, Go away, Teddy, I'm busy. Thanks to the conspirators, the tables were turned that night, for Hayes sent up a wilderness of flowers, with a loverly basket arranged in his best manner for a centerpiece. Then the March family turned out in mass, and Joe exerted herself to some purpose, for people not only came, but stayed, laughing at her nonsense, admiring Amy's taste, and apparently enjoying themselves very much. Laurie and his friends gallantly threw themselves into the breach, bought up the bouquets, encamped before the table, and made that corner the liveliest spot in the room. Amy was in her element now, and out of gratitude, if nothing more, was as sprightly and gracious as possible, coming to the conclusion, about that time, that virtue was its own reward after all. Joe behaved herself with exemplary propriety, and when Amy was happily surrounded by her guard of honor, Joe circulated about the hall, picking up various bits of gossip, which enlightened her upon the subject of the Chester change of base. She reproached herself for her share of the ill-feeling, and resolved to exonerate Amy as soon as possible. She also discovered what Amy had done about the things in the morning, and considered her a model of magnanimity. As she passed the art table, she glanced over at it for her sister's things, but saw no sign of them. Tucked away out of sight, I dare say, thought Joe, who could forgive her her own wrongs, but hotly resented any insult offered her family. Good evening, Miss Joe. How does Amy get on? asked May with a conciliatory air, for she wanted to show that she also could be generous. She has sold everything she had that was worth selling, and now she is enjoying herself. The flower table is always attractive, you know, especially to gentlemen. Joe couldn't resist giving that little slap, but May took it so meekly she regretted it a minute after, and fell to praising the great faces which still remained unsold. Is Amy's illumination anywhere about? I took a fancy to buy that for father, said Joe, very anxious to learn the fate of her sister's work. Everything of Amy sold long ago. I took care that the right people saw them, and they made a nice little sum of money for us, returned May, who had overcome sundry small temptations, as well as Amy had that day. Much gratified, Joe rushed back to tell the good news, and Amy looked both touched and surprised by the report of May's word and manner. Now, gentlemen, I want you to go and do your duty by the other tables, as generously as you have by mind especially the art table, she said, ordering out Teddy's owns, as the girls called the college friends. Charge, Chester, charge, is the motto for that table, but do your duty like men, and you'll get your money's worth of art in every sense of the word, said the irrepressible Joe, as the devoted phalanx prepared to take the field. To hear is to obey, but march is fair far than may said little Parker, making a frantic effort to be both witty and tender, and getting promptly quenched by Laurie, who said, Very well, my son, for a small boy, and walked him off with a paternal pat on the head. By the vases, whispered Amy to Laurie, as a final heaping of coals of fire on her enemy's head. To May's great delight, Mr. Lawrence not only bought the vases, but pervaded the hall with one under each arm, the other gentlemen speculated with equal rashness in all sorts of frail trifles, and wandered helplessly about afterward, burdened with wax flowers, painted fans, filigree portfolios, and other useful and appropriate purchases. Aunt Carol was there, 
heard the story, looked pleased, and said something to Mrs. March in a corner, which made the latter lady beam with satisfaction, and watch Amy with a face full of mingled pride and anxiety, though she did not betray the cause of her pleasure till several days later. The fair was pronounced a success, and when May bade Amy good night, she did not gush as usual, but gave her an affectionate kiss, and the look which said, Forgive and forget. That satisfied Amy, and when she got home she found the vases paraded on the parlor chimney-piece with a great bouquet in each. The reward of merit for a magnanimous march, as Laurie announced with a flourish. You've a deal more principle and generosity and nobleness of character than I ever gave you credit for, Amy. You've behaved sweetly, and I respect you with all my heart, said Joe warmly, as they brushed their hair together late that night. Yes, we all do, and love her for being so ready to forgive. It must have been dreadfully hard, after working so long and setting your heart on selling your own pretty things. I don't believe I could have done it as kindly as you did, added Beth from her pillow. Why, girls, you needn't praise me so. I only did as I'd be done by. You laugh at me when I say I want to be a lady, but I mean a true gentlewoman in mind and manners, and I try to do it as far as I know how. I can't explain exactly, but I want to be above the little meannesses and follies and faults that spoil so many women. I'm far from it now, but I do my best, and I hope in time to be what mother is. Amy spoke earnestly, and Joe said with a cordial hug, I understand now what you mean, and I'll never laugh at you again. You are getting on faster than you think, and I'll take lessons of you in true politeness, for you've learned the secret, I believe. Try away, dearie, you'll get your reward some day and no one will be more delighted than I shall. A week later, Amy did get her reward, and poor Joe found it hard to be delighted. A letter came from Aunt Carol, and Mrs. Marchface was illuminated to such a degree when she read it that Joe and Beth, who were with her, demanded what the glad tiding were. Aunt Carol is going abroad next month, and once... "'Me to go with her!' burst in Joe, flying out of her chair in an uncontrollable rapture. "'No, dear. Not you. It's Amy.' "'Oh, mother, she's too young. It's my turn first. I've wanted it so long. It would do me so much good, and be so altogether splendid. I must go.' "'I'm afraid it's impossible, Joe,' aunt says Amy, decidedly.' and it's not for us to dictate when she offers such a favor. It's always so. Amy has all the fun, and I have all the work. It isn't fair, oh, it isn't fair, cried Joe passionately. I'm afraid it's partly your own fault, dear. When Aunt spoke to me the other day, she regretted your blunt manners and too independent spirit. And here she writes as if quoting something you had said. I planned at first to ask Joe, but as favors burden her, and she hates French, I think I won't venture to invite her. Amy is more docile, will make a good companion for Flo, and receive gratefully any help the trip may give her. Oh, my tongue, my abominable tongue! Why can't I learn to keep it quiet, groaned Joe, remembering words which had been her undoing. When she had heard the explanation of the quoted phrases, Mrs. March said sorrowfully, I wish you could have gone, but there is no hope of it this time, so try to bear it cheerfully, and don't sadden Amy's pleasure by reproaches or regrets. I'll try, said Joe, winking hard as she knelt down to pick up the basket she had joyfully upset. I'll take a leaf out of her book and try not only to seem glad, but to be so, and not grudge her one minute of happiness. But it won't be easy, for it's a dreadful disappointment, and poor Joe bedewed the little fat pincushion she held with several very bitter tears. Joe, dear, I'm very selfish, but I couldn't spare you, 
and I'm glad you're not going quite yet, whispered Beth, embracing her, basket and all, with such a clinging touch and loving face that Joe felt comforted in spite of the sharp regret that made her want to box her own ears and humbly beg Aunt Carol to burden her with this favor and see how gratefully she would bear it. By the time Amy came in, Joe was able to take her part in the family jubilation, not quite as heartily as usual, perhaps, but without repinings at Amy's good fortune. The young lady herself received the news as tidings of great joy, went about in a solemn sort of rapture, and began to sort her colors and pack her pencils that evening, leaving such trifles as clothes, money, and passports to those less absorbed in visions of art than herself. It isn't a mere pleasure trip to me, girls, she said impressively, as she scraped her best palette. It will decide my career, for if I have any genius, I shall find it out in Rome, and will do something to prove it. Suppose you haven't, said Joe, sewing away with red eyes at the new collars which were to be handed over to Amy. Then I shall come home and teach drawing for my living, replied the aspirant for fame with philosophic composure. But she made a wry face at the prospect, and scratched away at her palate as if bent on vigorous measures before she gave up her hopes. No, you won't. You hate hard work and you'll marry some rich man, and come home to sit in the lap of luxury all your day, said Joe. Your predictions sometimes come to pass, but I don't believe that one will. I'm sure I wish it would, for if I can't be an artist myself, I should like to be able to help those who are, said Amy, smiling, as if the part of Lady Bountiful would suit her better than that of a poor drawing teacher. Hm, said Joe with a sigh. If you wish it, you'll have it, for your wishes are always granted, mine never. Would you like to go? asked Amy, thoughtfully parting her nose with her knife. Rather! Well, in a year or two I'll send for you, and we'll dig in the forum for relics and carry out all the plans we've made so many times. Thank you. I'll remind you of your promise when that joyful day comes, if it ever does, return Joe accepting the vague but magnificent offer as gratefully as she could. There was not much time for preparation, and the house was in a ferment till Amy was off. Joe bore up very well till the last flutter of blue ribbon vanished, when she retired to her refuge, the garret, and cried till she couldn't cry any more. Amy likewise bore up stoutly till the steamer sailed. Then, just as the gangway was about to be withdrawn, it suddenly came over her that a whole ocean was soon to roll between her and those who loved her best, and she clung to Lori, the last lingerer, saying with a sob, Oh, take care of them for me, and if anything should happen, I will, dear, I will, and if anything happens, I'll come and comfort you, whispered Lori, little dreaming that he would be called upon to keep his word. So Amy sailed away to find the old world, which is always new and beautiful to young eyes, while her father and friend watched her from the shore, fervently hoping that none but gentle fortunes would befall the happy-hearted girl, who waved her hand to them till they could see nothing but the summer sunshine dazzling on the sea. End of chapter Recording by CalmDragon.net